Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next episode in our series of workshops on integrative organismal modeling of movement. Uh, these workshops are sponsored by the National Science Foundation Division of Integrative Organismal Systems to help generate discussion and collaboration between experimental and theoretical scientists and help the community make effective use of analytical and modeling tools for understanding organismal biology. These workshops are recorded and shared as an online resource hosted through the UCI Center for Integrative Movement Sciences. And today's workshop is the uh, second workshop on morphological methods in evolutionary biomechanics. Today's presenters are Stacy Farina, Aki Watanabe, Chris Martinez, and Mike Rainbow. And I'll pass everything over to them. Thanks. All right, thanks Monica for the introduction. Um, so uh, yeah, a week ago, uh, four of us presented on uh, topics ranging from morphometrics to kinematics and uh, joint mobility. And so today what we're going to do is uh, cover uh, similar themes through a series of uh, four different tutorials. So um, first, we're going to introduce you to a free um, resource for obtaining uh, 3D morphological data, then show you how to digitize 3D uh, land, uh, landmark data. and then that will be followed by a tutorial for digitizing and plot, uh, plotting kinematic data using geometric morphometrics. And then we'll round things out with um, a tutorial on how to compute the finite helical axis uh, in joints. So uh, each of the presenters um, prepared materials for you to follow along with today. So um, uh, and since the session is being recorded, you can either uh, go through it live with them or uh, go over it later if you encounter any technical issues or if you just wanna work through things a bit slower. So um, without any further delays, uh, Stacy, um, go ahead and take over. All right, hello everyone. I'm Stacy Farina from Howard University. And my part of the workshop is really very introductory. So our participants um, and those watching might be familiar with a lot of these things, but I wanted to start off the workshop with making it very accessible for anybody um, with any level of experience to uh, get something out of it. And so my goal is to, it's gonna be two parts. One, a short tour of the Morphosource website, which has a repository for a bunch of 3D data sets. And uh, then we're gonna open one of the data sets in Slicer, 3D Slicer, which is a three, uh, free program um, that Aki is also gonna use in his demo following mine. And so that is a, a free program for CT analysis. Uh, it's a little clunky, a little difficult to get started in, but it is free and open source. And there's a lot of people developing various modules for it. So it's a great tool to try to get familiar with um, even just a little bit. And so I put a link in the chat and I'm sure those at home have, you know, the, this is probably the webpage that you navigated to the workshop materials. And so if you wanna follow along, um, the two things that you can do, um, if you scroll to the bottom of that page and look at segment one, that's my segment, uh, there is uh, the segment one description is a word is a, a Google, uh, Google Doc that has step by step what we're going to do today. And so that's as more of a reference for so you don't have to take notes or anything. Um, but also, there's a link to download and install 3D Slicer. So if you want to follow along, along with me or Aki, then I would recommend downloading that now. Um, and getting it installed. It's not a super large um, installation. And also the other thing to download is the CAT Morphosource CT data. That's a zip file. It's about 200 megs. It shouldn't be a super long download. The other two are there for your reference and I will refer to them. Um, so let's get started with Morphosource. And the reason that I am really excited about Morphosource, here's our webpage here. I probably should have had this up. Um, just so that you can take a quick peek. Um, uh, this is These are the two things to download. Download and install 3D Slicer. It's a program for looking at CT data. And then here's the data set we're going to work with. All right, so this is morphosource.org. And so I want to just give you a tour because I'm really excited about this repository because, you know, five 
um, years ago, uh, people were just starting to get into CT data. There was a little bit of, I think Morphosaurus had a little bit of momentum, but you know, so much has changed in, you know, even just the past five years with the amount of 3D data that's accessible to the average user. So even if you're completely unfamiliar with using 3D data, um, let's say you have a hypothesis of a biomechanical relationship with, um, with morphology and you just want to be able to look at the morphology um, or you want to 3D print something um, or you want to do um, a more like evolutionary analysis, then Morphosource is a great resource because there are thousands and thousands of species that have been scanned already. It's mostly vertebrates because bone um, shows up on CT very well, um, but also there are plants, there are invertebrates, there are all sorts of creatures. People have been really looking at a lot of different stuff and they post it free. There are various ways that they want you to be able to use it. So each, um, each entry has its own license and usage rules. Um, but most, the general philosophy here is that, um, you know, we're sharing the data and want people to use it. So, and feel free to interrupt at any point with uh, questions. So the two main ways that I like to search um, is using the browse function or the search function on Morphosource. There are a couple different other ways to get access to things, but um, I try to browse by biological taxonomy. If I know, let's say that I have a particular species in mind that I want to find, I can type the species name directly into the search bar and we'll do that as an example, but you have to be really specific about the species otherwise nothing will pop up but let's say you just want to look at all the frogfish or something if you know the taxonomy and assuming the taxonomy is correct in morphosource which is not always but it's pretty good um you can browse by taxonomy um, does anybody have a group of organisms that they want to try to find yep uh Khalil? Oh, i didn't i couldn't hear you what was that Cichlids? Okay, yeah, let's try to find cichlids. Let's see if I know enough. So they're going to be animals. And they are going to be chordates, chordata. And it is, it does, it is a little slow, but it's 3D data. You got to give it some credit. Uh, and and so let's see, we've got Actinopterygii. And so, you know, it's not fully bifurcated, you know, taxonomy, but it's, it's, you know, kind of, however people enter the taxonomy is how it gets put into the system. So what's one of the larger groups that contains the cichlids? Um. Person form should be okay. And then there's just the one family, right? Or are there many families? Cichlidae, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we can already see that there are um, over uh, almost 2,000 specimens and over 400 unique names there are lots of different species so yeah there's quite a bit and you can also get a kind of a sense from the abbreviations those are museums so most of the material and morphosource is associated with a museum specimen and so these like ansp um is the academy of national sciences in philadelphia um the uw collection so um so there's a lot of material here and that's, oh, they do break it down by genus. So we could even get further and, and look at a specific genus. So I, that's the one, I, this is the one that I use the most. And especially if you don't know what is out there, you know, it's hard to use a search function because sometimes you don't always, you know, get, um, it, you don't know how the taxonomy is coded in uh, Morphosource until you start poking around. All right, so that was awesome. That's a great example. Um, any other examples? Glenna or Samantha, do you have any recommendations? Uh, maybe lacerted lizards? Ah, um, yeah, so we could do that by the taxonomy. 
Um, well, let's let's try this. So what is it? I, I want to I wanted to try something where I could show you the the search bar function. Lesser today. This is my. All right. Did I spell it correctly? Yeah, oh, it looks right. Yeah. Okay. It has to be pretty right because like the, this is not a very uh, intelligent search. Um, let me just. I usually just Google it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's search. Oh, it's telling me I've got something. Okay, let's try this. Extra T for the D there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the second T. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and so usually you do have to search by species, but sometimes if it's coded correctly, if the if if the taxonomy is correct in Morphosource, then sometimes family name will get you there. Yeah. So um, it's possible. I don't want to spend too much time walking through um, the browse. Um, but uh, so most of the time when I use search, it's because I'm looking for a specific, uh, a specific um, genus and species. Because I think, I mean, I think the higher level taxonomy is, is organized in here, but I'm not 100% sure. But if you, if you search for a species, you will definitely see anything that comes up that is associated with that species, at least. Um, Another thing that's really great, so that now it just pulled up all of the records. Um, and so if you, one of the things that I like to do if I'm browsing through the search is to limit by type. So most of the data is going to be CT, um, but also there are tons of meshes and meshes are 3D objects. And so that's what we're going to be making in 3D Slicer. And so if you, you can limit your search to only mess it, meshes and then anything that you find will be something that you can um, open up and be able to, you can actually even visualize it. You can visualize CT data. It's not great on Morphosource, but you can actually, this is an interesting mesh. What, what is this? I didn't even, um, I think maybe it's a fossil of some kind. Uh, but you can see that you can actually, like, if it's a mesh, you can actually manipulate it in 3D directly on Morphosource. So I'm going to pull up the record that we're going to use today. So the data that I had you download is actually from Morphosource, and you can download it directly, but you have to make an account, and it takes a little bit of time. So just to, if you want to follow along, I would download that data set. And I'm going to pull it up here. I can click on any of the any of the objects that are associated. This is from 3D Anatomy Studios, which is an awesome group of young folks who are who've made a little business of, you know, making um, educational materials with 3D anatomy. And so they have this cat specimen. And so um, if you click on the actual, the specimen record is always going to be on the top. And this is the record here. So I'm going to try to get to the data set that I had you download. So if you are on the record for the biological specimen, it will give you everything that's associated with that specimen. So this is the same cat, but they scanned the arm. Um, they scanned the, you know, the front half of the body, the back half of the body. They've got a lot of stuff on here. Um, also, and most of this, you'll see it says CT next to it instead of mesh, even though it kind of looks like a mesh, they just took meshes and made that they made screenshots for their CT data, but these are all CT. I do, I, I threw up this mesh, um, uh, because every time I just like sit down and make something like I did this for comparative anatomy, I always just put it up on Morphosource because I figure if I put the time in, I might as well um, have it there. So you can download this right now and have this cat skull. Um, you don't have to work with the CT data. Um, and let's just go through a couple other things associated with this record. So uh, if you look at Morphosource, there's a lot of information. There is who created it. And also you can see that it's linked to this broader specimen that a lot of people are working on. Um, you can see the file size. Um, you can see how the data were originally collected. So this is a this is a um, one acquisition event, and we've got two pieces of media now associated with that, at least two. Um, and then there's um, various licensing. So this is set up where you can download it um, for three D printing. You can download it for pretty much anything you can think of, except you can't use it for any commercial purposes. You can't use it to make money. Um, so, uh, so that is Morphosource. Any questions before we jump into Slicer? I'll show you just a couple things.
and also people can so you can make your own profile if you get into this stuff you can make your own profile so mine's called the Farina laboratory so like anytime I make something for comparative anatomy I just stick it up here. So lots of people are working on this I highly recommend that you that you poke around. All right, so now we're going to work with this cat data set, which is the exact same one we were looking at it's here also the mesh file that I just showed you is here, if you want to download it, you can also download it from Morphosource. Um, but we're going to be working with this data set which is downloaded as a zip file so i'm going to share let's see um now i'm going to share 3d slicer Okay, so this is 3D Slicer, and I'm going to give you a very, this is a, a huge um, program that you can get into. Um, also on the web page, we were just looking at for the, the that have all of the materials um, that this probably the way that you access this webinar. Um, the one of the folder, one of the PDFs that you can download is a paper written by Thaddeus Buser and a whole bunch of other really awesome folks that have painstakingly made an incredible guide to slicer so i'm just going to give you the quick start if you have the data set in front of you you can do this with me right now um, you don't have to follow along um, but if those of you at home if you want to give this a try um, i just want to get you started and see how quickly you actually can get started working with data um, so this the data that i um, downloaded. i didn't really talk about too, too much about different types of data um, but ct data gets stored as image files and there are in that paper um, uh, by Thaddeus Buser, um, you can see lots of different ways of um, taking images, uh, stacks of images from Morphosource and loading them into Slicer. There actually are a few steps before this. Um, if you have DICOMs, you can actually go immediately into Slicer. And that's what you have with your with the CAT data set. It's actually DICOMs and DICOMs are image like image stacks. So there are a bunch of uh, images, but they have metadata associated with them so that they can be um, automatically loaded into a DICOM reader like Slicer with all of the, with calibration, size, everything all set to go. So um, if we're working with other data from Morphosource, there may be a few steps before you get to this, but the paper lays that all out. But for us today, we're going to click on load DICOM data because that's what we have with the cat. And we're going to click import DICOM files and we just navigate to our folder. So mine is under documents, um, IOMM. And so you may have to outside the program unzip. So this is the file that you would have downloaded. Um, and so this is a, this is what you get directly from Morphosource. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that you're if you're doing this, um, you probably have to unzip you have to unzip the big file and then you'll also have to go then click inside this file because when you download something from morphosource it gives you a bunch of different things it gives you a pdf that has a bunch of information about commercial licenses and some of the metadata associated with the specimen and then your specimen record is in here and then you you'll have to unzip the head so the head is the part of the cat we're looking at and so this is a, another zip file within a zip file so you'll have to make sure i've already unzipped this one um so i'm just going to hit import but you have to unzip both of them i'm not sure if you can do it let me see if you can do it right from no i think you can't do it in slicer you have to do it outside in whatever file manager system you have all right so i'm going to import that um and it's very easy to import with dicoms um and so uh, anybody who's following along, anyone have any questions? All good? Awesome. All right, if you do follow along, I want you to be able to do that and not um, get lost. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a volume rendering. So the way that Slicer is organized is all of the different tools that you need are organized into modules. And um, I think Aki is going to show you modules for landmarking. Um, and I'm going to just show you volume rendering um, for just making. This is how you make a really easy, um, just like a, a, a visual of your 3D data set. And then we're going to briefly go through segmentation. 
Um, and so we're going to use the segment editor and then look at segmentations. And so um, there's lots of different modules because this is open source. Um, there's folks working on different modules, making them better. Uh, and so there's that's how, how Slicer is, is organized. And you can download more modules if you want to do more sophisticated things. All right, so we are now on the volume rendering module. And all we have to do now is click. Oh, hold on. Did I already mess up? Did I not? Okay, well, oh, I, I forgot to hit load. Okay, so now that it's in, you do have to hit load. Okay, so here's now, okay, we're good. So here's our DICOM data set. And now we can see we've got a panel up um, up top that shows the 3D view. We don't have anything there yet. We'll get there in a second. But now we also have three different planes. And depending on how the scan was done, they may correspond to, you know, coronal, frontal. Um, but uh, they, for the most part, it's just three different planes. And you can, you can move around the slices um, so you can see where you're at. So you can see already a lot of 2D stuff. Make sure your data is loaded in properly. Um, and then let's go to volume rendering like we were trying to do before. OK, so we want to select our volume. And then to get our volume, the first thing we have to do is click the little I button. So that's a feature of, of Slicer that is um, pretty um, uh, consistent. You know, if you want, if you're not seeing something that you want to see, you can click look for an eyeball. And that's usually the, the solution. So now we're able to see our volume. So now we have something in this 3D area. Um, and if we want to um, if we want to make it look a little nicer um, in terms of orienting the specimen, we can say fit to volume. I think this little button up here um, does the same thing. So this oh, I'm cl clicking this little tiny button in the top left um, of the purple panel. There we go. All right, so now the, our 3D volume is contained um, right in the center of our screen. And so um, we we can see we can see a lot of the scan. So this basically is is you know all of the scan data displayed. And so we want to threshold. Um, and so um, the first thing that the, um, the guide recommends is to, instead of just messing around with threshold, there are actually some nice presets that will get you pretty close to the threshold that you want. Um, and so I usually pick the first one. And so now we can start to see the shape of the head, you know, kind of. Um, and so, but we want a threshold a little bit more. And we can use the shift to do that. So now you can see that we... Um, oh, by the way, the um, if you're following along, the zoom is right click scroll. Um, I'm also just using two finger scroll on my trackpad. And so now you can see, okay, we've got something taking taking shape. And so I usually use the volume rendering mo mo module if, if I'm trying to make, you know, publication quality images. Um, and so you can really mess around. There's lots and lots of different settings. And the guide goes through uh, how to use the different settings and make this look exactly how you want. Um, and so you can make really nice publication quality images of your 3D model pretty quickly this way. Um, and so what it's doing is it's pulling up a volume, which is basically the, the 3D data set rendered in 3D. And that's very different from a surface or a mesh, um, which we have to get through uh, we have to acquire through the segmentation um, process. So instead of just you know showing the data and and having showing various densities um, as they appear in the scan, um, a mesh is something that um, uh, renders the data um, as a three D object uh, with faces, and so it's it's not as concerned with with um, showing you the different densities. And color and having a different color map for density, it's just showing you a 3D reconstruction. Um, and so, th in theory, it's something that you could 3D print um, or manipulate or landmark, like Aki will show you. 
So let's talk about any questions about volume rendering before we jump over to segmentation. I think I can get this back in there. There are various shortcuts. I tried to put as many as I could on the um, on the Google Doc. Let's see. That's also a little slow because I'm sharing my screen. All right, I don't want I don't want to make it too upset. We, we can uh, I think we can just snap it back that way. OK, question. yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so these are CT scan images. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, have, uh, I guess, skeleton and muscle, um, I guess it's all included there. So when you when you move through a different when you move through a surface, like I can see in your main view, you just have bone, but then there's more than just bone on the bottom view. Is that right? Um. So uh, this wasn't like iodine stained or anything. Um, you can have multiple volumes, so you can like copy a volume and bring both of them into the same panel and then either toggle back and forth or overlay them on top of each other. And you control that in the volumes uh, module. And so you can, like if you did have muscle and bone in the same scan, you could um, have them as two separate um, volumes so that they could each have their own density color profiles and then sort of stack them on top of each other um, so you can see them both. This just has bone, the, the stuff, I mean, you can see some soft tissue, um, the, anything that, that was um, absorbing the x-rays, you can see a little bit, um, but for the most part, this is what we're seeing in the, in white is bone. But yeah, you can stain an iodine and um, with iodine and other stains to get, you know, soft tissue. All right. Um, so how do we want to do this in terms of we started five minutes late? Does that mean I get I can get another like three more minutes or do I have to do I have to yield my time? Yeah, oh no, we can okay. we can be flexible about that, of course. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I just have a few more things I want to show because volume rendering is a really easy, it's like the fastest way to just get a publication quality image very quickly. Um, the other thing that you can do if like if you want to 3D print is that segmenting process we talked about. So here is the segmentation editor. And so a segment, a segment is when you highlight specific um, parts of the scan. And we're talking about voxels now instead of pixels because this is 3D space. Um, so uh, highlighting specific parts of the scan that you want to render as a surface or a mesh. Um, but I'm using those interchangeably. They both mean the same thing. Um, and so I'm going to say the first thing to do is click the add button because that's going to give you a new segment. I'm also going to, I'm actually going to go over to the volume module and turn the volume rendering off so that we don't see that anymore. And then let's go to the segment editor. Um, and so now we want to go down. We've got a couple different th ways we can make our segment. And hang on. Okay, there we go. Nice and zoomed in now. Um, and so the different buttons that we have, there's a bunch of different options for how to make a segment, but the, the first one you're almost always going to want to click is threshold. And so if you look at this right now, it's starting to flash green anything that it's going to include inside the segment. And so anything, basically anything that's not literally black is now included. So anything, you know, in, in the gray color palette, um, gray to white. And so we want to make that a little bit more selective um by uh going scrolling down the threshold allows you to look at the thresholding range and so we are going to um, increase our range or like decrease the range but increase the um, pixel values that we're targeting and so you can see as i'm doing that the the darker um grays are going away and we're left with just the um the bone and so I'm going to keep doing that. You can kind of look across. It's convenient to look across all three and kind of see there's this was wrapped in some either water or ethanol. So you can see at the tip of the snout, there's some water, probably some cheesecloth wrapped around the face or something. So I'm going to try to get rid of that. That's pretty good. All right. And so now when, when we have it um, the way we want, we can hit apply. And this is going to take a second.
Oh, I, I think I, I have to hit the, oh, the eye is already open. Oh, show 3D. All right, so this is going to be thinking for a sec. Okay, so there's my model. So I could I could export and 3D print this right now, but you can see it wouldn't 3D print very well because it's got lots of random floaty pieces. And there's lots of ways to clean this up. You can crop, you can use, there's a scissor tool so you can literally cut away the things you don't want. The easiest way to get rid of, of just random stuff though is to use the island tool. And so I clicked islands, keep largest island, and then I'm gonna hit apply. And what that's going to do is just, it's going to take it's going to take the largest it's going to keep the largest bit of specimen that's not connected to anything else and so it's going to get rid of all the things that are not connected to the main skull on slicer you can do it And so now you can see everything is gone. It's just our skull. So this is something that we could 3D print. And so if we wanted to do that, we would go now we're, let's say this, we're happy. This is our segment now. And so let's say we're happy with this. And, and you could get really detailed. You could paint specific structures. You could isolate really small structures from this. But let's just say we want to um, print this whole thing. Instead of segment editors, now we're going to go and do things with the segment. Um, in the segmentations module. And this is where you can click on the segment and export. So you just scroll down to export, import, and mod models and label maps. So if you do do some of the labeling that Aki's going to show you, you can also output the label maps as well. You want to click model if you want to um, be exporting a 3D model, like a mesh for 3D printing. Um, you do have some options in terms of the um, file types. Um, I think that comes, oh, and it's here, export um, to export to files is what you want. Um, and so you can choose the folder, STL is fine. Any of these are fine, but STL and OG, OBJ are the most common ways to 3D print. And then you choose your folder and you click export. All right, so I think that um, that's my time. So, um, I don't know if we have time for a couple quick questions, but hopefully those at home, if you want to reach out to me um, for anything, let me know. Um, but hopefully this encourages you to see that it's not so difficult to get started in Slicer. All right, thanks. Okay, um, I guess it's my turn. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Aki Watanabe. I'm a faculty at New York Institute of Technology, College of Osteopathic Medicine. And um, I'm going to sort of dovetail off of Stacy's great presentation on how to make, you know, 3D mesh from, you know, data coming from, for example, Morphosource and how we can collect um, quantitative shape data from our models uh, using landmarks. All right, so we're going to be using the same program, um, Slicer a 3D slicer, and then we're gonna use a specific module in there um, to um, map on um, anatomical landmarks that we can use for morphological analysis. Um, okay, so then before I start getting into it, I just wanted to, well, let's first share my screen. Um, and so this is the um, web page where you can download the, um, the data set for this workshop. And then if you go down, um, you'll see this is segment two. So then you'll need a 3D slicer uh, if you haven't downloaded that already. And then you can um, download and install the slicer morph module within the 3D slicer app. So I can go over that real quick in a little bit. Uh, and then you'll need, uh, if you wanna follow along uh, with this section, you want to um, download some of the skull mesh files. If you click on that, it'll lead you to a Google Drive folder. And these are some kind of sample uh, mammal 
skull mesh files. And these are ply files. So that's kind of like the STL files and OBJ files that um, Stacy uh, went over at the very end when we were ex exporting 3D model files. Uh, and then if we have time, we can um, do some basic analysis in R. Uh, and what's nice is R Studio together with R and R Studio is a nice kind of graph, has a nice graphic user interface where you can um, run the code and then see kind of the output in, in the same window. So it's a very handy way of uh, working with the R programming language. Okay, so with that, um, actually before I go on, um, I also want to show that in here, there should be um, a landmark in tutorial um, where I've kind of outlined the steps that we're going to be taking. Um, this outlines a step-by-step -step procedure for basically what I'll be covering during the section. All right. Um, yeah, and if we could, um, if you have any questions, quick questions while I go over this, um, feel free to jump in. And if it's a kind of a quick um, answer, then I, I'm happy to show it while I go over this. Okay, so then the first step is, um, yeah, open up 3D Slicer, and then we're gonna use the um, Slicer Morph module. So what you can do is if you go to uh, View and then Extensions Manager, and then go to the Install Extensions tab up here, and then you can search for Slicer Morph, and it should be the top and only hit. And then you can, I've already installed it, but this button should say install. And then, so you'll click on that. Uh, and then after you do that, it should show up in this manage extensions tab as a module being already installed in the in 3D Slicer. So once you have that, you can exit out of the um, extension manager, go back to the main 3D Slicer window, um, and then the first step is, of course, to load in the data. So we're going to load in those mammal skull mesh, uh, mesh data and files. So we're going to click on load data, uh, and then we're going to choose files to add. And then I'm going to go to where I save those mammal mesh files. So it should be under it's on my desktop and skull mesh files. And then you can select all of them, all three. Okay, and then I'll click open. And then these are indeed models. So you should be able to just hit okay. Okay, and then what you'll see is all three of them have loaded, but you know, they kind of look like a sort of a mutant <laughs> animal because they've loaded simultaneously in the same coordinate system. But you can hear that already, you know, these skulls are oriented in different ways. So even if I were to start collecting landmark data, which we will do shortly, um, the X y, and, X, y, and Z values associated with those landmark data will kind of be biologically meaningless, right? Because these uh, specimens were digitized in different orientations. So then we'll, after we collect our landmark data, we'll go through a Procrustes alignment where we will systematically align these uh, coordinate data, these landmark data, so that we can use them to study shape. Okay, so after we load in, in the mesh files, obviously we can't really work with all these showing. So like Stacy was going over, you know, you can use these, this eye icon to, you know, remove, you know, hide certain models. And actually let's um, ask the participants, which, um, mammal would you like to start with? So this is a, a goody, this is a rodent, uh, domestic cat, Felis, uh, and then this is a quokka, which is, a, I believe it's a marsupial. I'm not a mammal specialist, so <laughs> I'm not 100% sure, but those are your choices. Any, any preferences? All right, let's start with a goody. Okay, so then I'm gonna hide all the others, and then this is what the skull looks like. Okay, and then I'm going to shift it down. Okay, so then to start putting in or you know, placing landmarks, we're going to use this markup module up here. Okay. And you can also go to that module by clicking on this field and it's a part of this drop down uh, menu and you can put markups. 
Okay, so then to start landmarking a specimen, you're gonna click this um, icon with three red circles, create fiducial markup. And actually, let me switch to sharing just the um, slicer. And hopefully you can see the icons a little bit better. Let me resize the window. Okay, so what I'll do is click on the, um, this icon that creates fiducial markup. You can rename it, and this will be associated with the specific specimen. So we can label it as a goody. Right, and then maybe since we'll be collecting just fiducial or what's called discrete landmarks, we can um, add that detail as well in the name. And then when you click on that, you'll see if you um, move your cursor to the 3D window, you know it'll have that green uh, landmark, and this is where you're going to place your first landmark. So you're going to then click, do a left click, and then it will place that landmark. And then for here, I'm gonna place it on the anterior most part of um, the premaxilla, right here. And then e even if let's say you screwed up and you put it here, you can hover the cursor over the landmark and then kind of shift it so that you can um, you know, reposition to be a bit more accurate. Um, okay, and then what you're gonna do instead of to place the next landmark, instead of clicking on this icon with the three circles, again, you're gonna actually go to the top and then you're gonna just place one, you click, click on this icon with a red circle with a blue arrow. And then if you move your cursor back to a 3D view, you know, you'll see that you can place another one. Let's put it maybe, yeah, like the anterior most midline point of the nasal bone, for example, right here, just above the external nares. And then let's put, another one here at the junction point between the nasal bone and the, the frontal bone here, okay? And so we got three midline points. Let's try to sample. So if, when you're thinking about the, your landmark scheme, you wanna make sure you want to put landmarks throughout the structure that you're interested in. So I'm probably gonna to wanna to put one towards the posterior end. So I might put it like maybe the um, most port posterior point of the parietal, which actually I can see the suture here, maybe right here. Okay, so that covers sort of the anterior posterior extent from landmark, the first landmark to the fourth landmark. And then we want to probably get like a lateral, you know, bilateral point. So let's try to find a point maybe on the zygomatic arch. Does anyone have a suggestion for where to place the landmark? How about the anterior tip of the zygomatic bone? Yeah, so this should be the yeah zygomatic bone right here. So yeah, let's put it, um, yeah, maybe antero superior point maybe of the, the zygomatic. So we'll put it here, great. And then maybe we'll get, you know, we'll have the same point on the other side. So let me, so the thing you need to remember when you're putting landmarks is to record or remember the order in which you place these landmarks because the, the sequence of landmarks need to be consistent and the same throughout all the specimens you're, you're working with. Okay, so we start with the, the right side. So then we're gonna go to the left side and then let's put another one here at the suture of the zygomatic. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So let's say, obviously we can put a lot more points, but in the interest of time, let's stop there. So we have, I think six, yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six landmark points. Okay. So then we have to do this on the other two specimens. So what we're going to do is we can actually let's, let's um, hit this fiducial, um, item right here and then we can actually change you know the display so we can you know, uh, change how you know transparent things are, the points are you can change the color if you want so if you want to display let's say you know like a red landmark so you can change the color and there are other um, settings here as well and 
And if you go under, go under the control points tab, you can see the list of landmarks you collected. And if you want to, you can rename it so they're, they're more dis descriptive. So, you know, the first one could say the anteriormost point on the premaxilla. What I'm gonna do though right now is to, since we're done with landmarking the specimen, I'm gonna lock the position of these landmarks by clicking on this icon next to interaction and views. Okay, and then now let's go back and work on the other two specimens. So I'm gonna go back to the data, um, explore data module, and then it'll list now this fiducial data set. And then let's, we've done Agouti, so let's hide that. And let's also hide the landmarks associated with Agouti. And then let's work on the domestic cat. Okay, and then now we're gonna go back to the markups module. Uh, and then let's add now another set of fiducial points. So we're gonna click this icon with three red circles. Let's rename this to uh, Felis Fiducial. And then you're going to put that first landmark on the premaxilla and then on the anterior part of the nasal. And I think we did one between nasal and frontal and then one at the posterior end of the parietal. And then we started with the right side in terms of the zygomatic bone. So actually, let me, oops, rotate. And actually it's, yeah, shifted in, in Felis right here. And then put it on the other side right here. Okay, so those are the six points in the same order. Again, can't stress enough that they have to be in the same uh, order. Okay, so then we're done with the domestic cat. Okay, let's do the last one. Go back to um, data oh, at the top and then hide both the landmark and the 3D model of the cat skull. And then we'll do the quokka genus Cetonix. And then again, we'll go back to the markups and then start putting in points. Go. All right, so now we're done collecting landmark data um, for all the three skulls. Um, and then, you know, in your own projects, you will probably have more specimens. So you'll do that for the rest of your specimens. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna save these landmark data. So each of the landmarks are gonna be associated with XYZ coordinates, right? And that's what you're seeing when you go to control points and then you can see the RAS. So I guess those are the um, axes, but these are the XY essentially the XYZ coordinate values that you're seeing. But like we uh, mentioned at the beginning of this section, the um, specimens are arranged, you know, they've been scanned in different orientations. So now we're gonna export the coordinate data and then align them all within this 3D slicer program. Okay, so the, what we need to do is we're gonna now go to save. So you can either click on the save icon or you can go up to the um, menu and then hit, you know, save there. And what you're gonna save is, you know, you're, you're gonna have a bunch of options. So what we're interested in is the JSON files. So those are the files that's gonna contain the coordinate values. All right, so I'm gonna uncheck the first one, which is a scene uh, for, for the 3D slicer program. And then we're gonna export the three um, coordinate landmark data files. All right, so we're gonna, and then we're gonna have to change the directory. Um, so you, I'm going to just save it on my desktop in this workshop uh, folder and hit save. Okay. And then after you hit save, what you're going to do now is we're going to align these coordinate data. So now you're going to use a different module. So we're going to go to slicer morph. And this is the reason why we installed that module 
go to geometric morph metrics, and we're going to run GPA. So GPA stands for generalized Procrustes alignment, and this is the alignment um, algorithm that we're going to use. And then in the new sort of menu or window, we're going to select landmark files, and this is the reason why ex we exported them. And then we got we have these three coordinate data corresponding to each specimen. You're going to hit open. And then you're going to select the um, output directory. So it's going to be the same place. You can exclude certain landmarks if you don't want to align uh, some of the landmarks. And then you're going to hit execute generalized procrustes alignment, as well as run a principal components analysis or PCA. OK, and then you're going to see that the window changes. And it's going to show different results. So. For example, this window in red is showing kind of the mean shape in one view. So it's going to be showing in a 2D view. So it might not be that useful since we're working with 3D data. Uh, Procrustes distances, these are the distances of the different um, specimens to the mean skull shape. So you can kind of tell that um, this species, uh, which is. Oh, the last one. So Quaka is like closest to the mean shape. So this might be useful, but you know, it's it might not be for a lot of the analysis that you do. Um, and then that's this table showing basically the this graph in the middle in in table form. All right. So what can we do now? Well, so we can then create a morpher space. So you can actually hit view output files, and the morpher space allows you to visualize the shape variation. So you can um, load previous analysis, and then it'll be um, organized by, I guess, time. So that should be it. And then, well, actually, it's not showing up here. Huh. See. Oh, explore data results. This might be it. Oh, okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, yeah, so you're going to hit the explore data slash results tab here. And then you're going to go under PCA, you know, scatter plot options. And this is where you can create um, a morpher space. So default, I don't know why, but it selects PC1 as both the X and the Y axis. So you want to change the Y axis to PC2, which explains about 20% of the uh, total shape variation. And then the first uh, principal components axis accounts for almost 80% of the variation. So together, you know, you have the vast majority of the shape variation accounted for. And then you click on the scatter plot button. And let me see if I can change the layout so I, I can expand that. Let's see. GPA or oh, plot only view. There we go. All right. So it's a little empty because we only have three specimens, but you can see these tiny like brown dots. And so these are um, the positions of the uh, specimens in terms of their skull shape. So, I mean, there, if we have more specimens, for example, maybe ones that are closely related to each of these species, you'll see, start seeing clusters based on their you know, evolutionary relatedness, right? And then you can look, view these um, morpher spaces and try to get a sense of like, how do these skull shapes vary across different taxonomic groups? Or maybe, you know, is there a difference between a control group and a treatment group? Um, so, you know, obviously you'll have a fuller, richer data set um, for your own projects, but this is how you can view uh, your own scatter plot. So, any questions so far? If not, I wanted to um, go over how you can collect different, you know, types of landmark data. So, I showed you how you can place distinct, um, discrete landmark points on skulls. Um, but what I'm going to show you now, let me go back to 3D view. Okay, and go to explore 
data module. Um, and then you'll see that, yeah, a lot of items have piled up because we've run the, analysis, the shape analysis. Um, but let's just show um, the, the models again. So let's pick a cat. And I think I need to zoom out. There we go. Okay. And let's say you want to collect curve landmarks, right? So let's say you want to maybe um, quantify the, maybe the margin of the zygomatic arch. Okay. So how would you do that, right? Like you, you can maybe figure out anatomical definitions for putting landmark here, you know, at suture points here. Um, but, you know, with maybe few points, you're not capturing the kind of the curvature or the outline of the zygomatic arch. So what you can do for that is collect uh, curve landmarks. And then so to do that, we're going to go back to the markups module. And then instead of clicking on this um, icon with three red circles, you're going to collect um, or you're going to click on open curve. But let's say you want to capture, let's say, a closed loop where maybe like a shape of the orbit, for example, um, then you can click on this um, create closed curve markup instead. But for the zygomatic arch, we're going to click on the um, open curve markup. And then when you move the cursor to the um, 3D view, then you can put as many points as you want to kind of accurately capture and follow that outline of the zygomatic arch. And as you lay down, it's going to create these like Bezier curves so that, you know, it's more kind of, it can follow um, curvatures instead of drawing like straight lines between the, the curves. And then if, when you're done, you can either, you know, you can uh, right click to finish. All right. So I didn't go all the way, but you get the point. Um, so this is a tool you can use to collect curve landmarks. And if you go under control points, or sorry, curve settings, um, you can then click on resample. And if you go down, you can sample as many you know, landmark, equidistant landmarks along this curve. So the default seems to be 20, but, you know, I can do 100. That might be a little overkill, but, you know, let's say 10 is probably pretty reasonable. So it's going to lay down 10 landmarks along this curve that you created. And then it's probably good to try and constrain points to the surface. So this is a cat. So we're going to click that, and that's going to map and project the curve landmarks onto the mesh surface instead of, like, being stuck you know, floating or inside of the mesh surface. And then you can hit this resample curve and then it'll um, resample it. And the way you can kind of confirm that is go to control points. And then for this curve, you should see a total of 10 points in this list. So it goes from one to 10. So that's how you can collect curve landmarks. Let's say you want to collect surface landmarks. And this is the last thing I will go over. Um, so again, we'll, we're going to be in this markup. Oh, sorry, not mark, markup. We have to actually use a different module to put down um, landmarks on a surface, on a um, mesh surface. So you're going to go to Slicer Morph, Geometric Morph Metrics, and then create semi-landmark uh, patches. Um, but before I do that, I need to constrain where I want to sample it using these fiducial points, the fixed landmarks. So I'm going to put go back to laying down fiducial points. Let's say I want to capture the kind of the topology of the nasal bone, right? So it's a roughly a triangular bone. So I can put three points at the kind of the vertices of this triangle. And then we're going to go back to slice or more geometric morph metrics and create semi landmark patches. And then this is where you're going to specify, you know, which specimen you're working with. So we're working with Felis and then landmark set. It's the F. This is the, the you know, the, these three points. And then 
we're going to draw that triangle based on the first three points. So it's going to be one, two, three. But let's say you want to, that triangle is composed of like the first and then the, like the fifth landmarks in the data set, and then maybe like an A. Then you can, you know, put something like that. But we're just going to deal with the first three and the only three landmarks in that data set. And then you can sample, let's say, yeah, 15 semi landmarks within that triangle. And under advanced um, options, you can kind of, if you're seeing that the landmarks are getting stuck inside or floating um, off of the um, mesh surface, you can kind of change the projection distance. But we'll just go with, I think the default was 25. Hit apply. And then let it load. And then it's put actually 15 rows of um, not 15 landmarks, but 15 rows of surface landmarks in that triangle. So that's probably overkill. So let's do six and then maybe we'll apply again. Yeah, and then delete the previous one. Yeah, so this is how you can, you know, try to capture and characterize topological uh, shape data within a certain region. But the limitation here is that you can only define it by, you know, a triangle. Um, so it might be a little difficult to do if, um, you know, it's a, if, if you're trying to characterize a more complex shape. Okay, um, I think that ends my section of the tutorial. Are there any questions from the participants? And it doesn't have to be limited to slice or morph either. Um, you know, if you have questions about landmarking in general, I'm happy to answer them. I have a question about their marking in general. Oh, could you repeat that real quick? Yep. Uh, I have a question about landmarking in general. Uh huh. Sure. Um, it's about when you don't have, when all of your specimens don't have homologous points. So when you have some specimens that lack certain structures that other specimens have, is there, is there a solution to that? Um, so I believe you can set to um, certain landmarks to be missing on certain, um, specimens. Um, I have to admit, I'm not super fluent in 3D Slicer because I use another program called um, Checkpoint um, or Landmark Editor uh, to place these 3D landmark points. Um, landmark Editor is a discontinued software um, that check, uh, Stratovan is a company, Stratovan Checkpoint. And it has a pretty um, generous uh, academic discount. It's $250 per year to use it. Um, so I, I find that program to be a bit more flexible if you want to collect uh, 3D landmark data. But yeah, going back to your question about missing data. Um, yeah, I have to, have to see. But one comment I can give is like a lot of the, when you, when it comes to aligning your coordinate data using generalized procrustes analysis, a lot of the, um, existing alignment uh, functions, they don't allow for missing data. Um, so you might, you know, get in trouble with that. So you, if you do have missing structures in some of the taxa, it's probably best to just leave that landmark out altogether. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I think I'll go ahead and, and start. Thank you, Aki, for that. Uh, it actually uh, transitions really nicely into, uh, into my section. Let me go ahead and share my screen first. Perfect, thank you. All right, um, so uh, before I get started, I wanted to just do a quick uh, um, announcement. So uh, if you downloaded uh, some of the data for this stuff uh, prior to yesterday afternoon, um, I've since updated the, the data folder. So um, uh, the original folder is called pig chewing. This new one is called pig chewing V2. So uh, while I'm giving an intro, you may choose to, to um, download that if, uh, if you don't have the most recent version. Um, all right, 
Well, uh, I'm excited to, to have a chance to, to walk through some methods um, with you that I've been working on recently. And, uh, uh, but first what I'm gonna do is start with a quick recap of some of the basics of this approach uh, that I presented last week. Um, and uh, so from the last tutorial by Aki, you should uh, be pretty familiar with uh, landmarks by now. Um, these are 2D landmarks um, uh, taken on a lateral, uh, a, a lateral perspective on a video. Um, and, uh, the, but this uh, analysis can also be applied to uh, motions that are captured in three dimensions. So uh, here I used uh, 10 fixed um, or discrete landmarks that are shown in blue. And then there's, uh, you, you can imagine eight sliding semi landmarks uh, distributed uh, at equal distances along that yellow dotted line on the bottom of the fish's head. And this is what those landmarks look like uh, when they're in motion. So if we take all of the, the landmarks sampled across the motion and do a shape alignment on them, uh, with the generalized Procrustes alignment, uh, we end up with something that looks like this. It's a trajectory of shapes. Um, and each point along the, the light blue line is a head shape at a different stage of the motion. Uh, on the left is, uh, uh, in yellow, is the head shape at the start of the motion. Uh, on the other end is, uh, uh, in red, is the full gape uh, head shape. And then the points in between uh, show the motion moving from left to right. And uh, the idea behind this approach is that we can extract functionally important information from these, these trajectories. Um, for example, the total length of this trajectory is a metric for, uh, for kinesis that was produced during the motion. Um, and if we compare a bunch of motions across many individuals and, and many species, we can get something that looks like this. Um, this is over 300 feeding motion trajectories in cichlid fishes. Um, and with a large volume of motion data in hand, we can start to ask questions about broad patterns of motion diversity and evolution. Um, for example, we can reconstruct the evolutionary history of cranial kinesis across the group, like you see on this uh, phylogeny here. Um, but for today, um, we're gonna be focusing on a non-fish example for this tutorial. And uh, we'll be looking at feeding in a pig uh, using this video that was made publicly available by uh, Beth Brainerd um, and which can be found on the XMA research portal. Um, and there's a link to that in the materials online. And so just like that fish example, we start with a set of landmarks. Um, in this case, it's a really simple configuration of, of four um, discrete landmarks. Uh, two of them are located on the anterior, the anterior teeth of the upper and lower jaws uh, for the uh, opening and closing of the gape. Uh, and then uh, we also have the dorsal and ventral points uh, along the snout uh, for movements of this kind of soft tissue region uh, relative to the rigid components uh, that are on the skull. And uh, so the landmark choice is really important for these analyses um, and should be really thought out with care. Um, in particular, you wanna make sure that your landmarks are functionally informative. So uh, here's an example from a paper of mine earlier this year where, um, where I made sure that the overall land, landmark configuration, which you see on the left, um, was able to capture information about specific features of the feeding motion. So you can see um, the examples on, uh, in the four images on the right, where sets of two or three landmarks can track either angular movements or linear displacements of, of different bones. So um, uh, shortly we'll go into the first part of this tutorial, uh, which is uh, digitizing landmarks from video frames. And we're gonna do this in an R package called Stereomorph, uh, but there's other digitizing programs that you can use. Um, the most popular one for 2D um, landmarking is TPS Dig, Dig2. Um, and uh, uh, the problem with that one is it only works on PCs. So today I wanted to show an example that could be done on any computer uh, and doesn't require a completely different program to download. So we can do it all in R. All right, so now I'm going to, let's see. Um, you should be looking at my desktop and on there is that pig chewing v2 folder that i have uh, unzipped and let's see i'm going to quickly go over some of the files that are in that folder 
um, as we as we work through them. Um, and you can find this information about the files um, in uh, a PDF called Guide to GM uh, Motion Tutorial that's also on the uh, the uh, workshop website. Um, but so in this in this folder, we have a uh, pig digitizing one byte um, file, and then this contains all the R code for digitizing landmark uh, data that um, I'm going to open in a minute. Uh, and then the landmark uh, key file is uh, just a text file that contains the names of all of the landmarks. So there's snout dorsal, snout ventral, upper jaw, and lower jaw. And the pig pig frames one byte folder contains the images that you'll um, digitize. And so I'll just open up the first one here. Um, see if it'll open up. Okay. And you can see that there are um, I've I've drawn on uh, the four landmarks just to make it easier for us to digitize in a second. And um, there's another folder called pig landmarks one byte, which you see here. And this is an empty folder where the landmark data that you'll uh, generate will be populated as you as you do it. Okay, so now let's uh, go to the pig digitizing one byte uh, R code, and we'll go ahead and open that. All right, so uh, the first the first three lines of this code just open up the um, the packages that we'll be using, and then we're gonna uh, set the directory um, to tell R where to pull files from and uh, open up the data or open up Stereomorph. And what will happen is it'll open this um, uh, this browser and that'll show the uh, the images that you've uh, that you've loaded. Uh, okay, so there's a couple quick things that, that you should do when you start off when you start off here. Um, if you go onto the settings tab, tab up here on the upper right, uh, clicking the automatically save, uh, automatically save when advancing to the next image box um, is nice because uh, otherwise the program will ask you to save the, the landmarks every time you go from image to image and that, you know, if you have a lot of images, it can get tedious to, to do that. So we click there and then we also want to have copy all landmarks to next image clicked. Um, this is a convenient uh, time saving function that uh, that stereo morph has it's, that, that you'll see in a second. Okay, so now we can go to the landmarks tab and what you'll see is that all of our four landmarks are are listed uh, here and uh, so the snout dorsal that is shown in bold so we can um, go over to the image and uh, double click and you can see a landmark appeared here that you can click on and drag around um, till you get it to the correct location. Then you go back to the landmark list, choose snout ventral, and that'll activate that one. So I do a double click here, that landmark appears, I can place it there. And then we'll do the same for the upper jaw landmark and the lower jaw landmark. And so, yeah, and you can move these around as you uh, as you need to to adjust their location, uh, and then we're gonna then we can just go to the next image here on the right hand side, and you'll see that what will happen is you'll um, the landmarks will be populated from the last image, but they're in their their position in the last image, so we need to adjust that, and so we just move them over, and when the the landmarks are in green, they're active, and you can move them. So we had to click double click on on them to make them active and adjust them as needed. And I'm just going to run through this. You'll notice that in the R console, there's some warnings that pop up um, about the structure of the of the data frame, but um, the, the structure is fine. I, I double checked it and um, it's just a warning. So you can disregard that for now, but I'm going to just go through quickly and move these landmarks to the correct location. There should be uh, 10 frames total that I'm that we're going to be digitizing. All right.
So I'll just work through this and hopefully if, if you're able to follow along, you can do the same. And you can see how these landmarks are, are tracking the movements of, of these anatomical features as, they're, as, as the motion is progressing. Okay. All right, we're on the last frame now. Okay, so once you're on the last frame and you're, you feel comfortable with your, your landmark placement, I did this quickly, so there's probably bound to be a little bit of messiness here. Um, but when, when we're comfortable with it, we go ahead and we can save one, one last time on the right hand side and then hit exit. And that'll that'll remove that um, that window there, and then we can continue on with this code. So now we're going to load that that data and then convert the format to um, uh, a form that that another package in R called Geomorph likes to use. Uh, then uh, the lines of code that are highlighted here do the generalized progressives analysis. Um, and and then uh, aligns or aligns and then um, uh, formats the the data for you. Um, one of the things about Stereomorph um, that's kind of quirky is that it, the uh, the y-axis landmarks are inverted. So I just wrote this quick code highlighted here that basically uh, uh, um, writes the the images uh, and then makes them all positive. So we'll just run that quickly. And um, this here plots the data for that um, for that motion. And you should end up with something that looks similar to this. Again, this is a, a bit messy, but what you'll see here is the point number one is the start of the motion. And then the motion moves to the right to point six, where the, the pig hits its maximum gait for that bite. And then it kind of heads back towards the left to the 10th point, which is the, the um, a closed mouth state again. All right, so I'm gonna close that out. Um, let's see. All right, so um, now that uh, uh, we've digitized the data and plotted it, you should see that if you go back to the uh, pig chewing um, folder, the pig landmarks are now populated. This was empty before and now they're, these files are all here. So we can click on any one of them and we can see the landmark coordinates uh, labeled there. One thing we didn't do is uh, add, uh, add a scale to this, but we could uh, if you wanted to convert the distances um, in these landmarks that are in pixels to, to real distances, um, but we don't need to do that for, for this example. So we'll just skip that for today. All right, um, so now we've digitized a single motion, but we often have a collection of motions that we wanna compare. And so that's what we'll do in the, the next section. So I'm gonna close out this R code here. And um, so if we go to the pig chewing folder, uh, click on, um, Let's see, the pig landmarks all. This contains um, uh, data for, for um, several biting motions that I previously digitized um, to save us some time today. Uh, and then we can open the pig trajectories.r file with code written to deal with these data. All right, so again, we're gonna load these these packages that we're interested in, in uh, using, set the directory and open the data. Then we're gonna do the shape alignment and um, 
yep, shape alignment there. And then invert the Y axis again. So now we're gonna do a, this, these lines of code here do a, uh, a PCA so we can plot the major axes of, of shape variation. And this, let's see, this is just a table to, to hold the, uh, the output of that and make a couple of variables for plotting. And then here's the, the plot. And what we'll, you'll see is something that looks like this. Um, and this is the trajectory data, the trajectory shape data. And what I'm gonna do is now kind of go over a couple of the details of that plot here. So um, here's that same plot with the um, color coded labels for each byte. And uh, the shapes on the right side of that plot are mostly associated with um, uh, uh, closed mouths uh, where the gape is minimal. And then on the left side, uh, there's shapes with the, the mouth wide open. Um, so the first bite uh, starts on the upper right here and then moves to the left as the pig opens its mouth. Then it starts to head back and kind of stops mid gape um, and gives way to the second and third bites, uh, which are kind of small movements with very little change in gape associated with them. Uh, and then there's also uh, differences in shape uh, along this axis in the, um, the angle of the two teeth relative to the gape. So there's a small angle between the teeth and, or sorry, between the teeth and the, um, the uh, um, snout here. And then uh, a larger angle on the right-hand side. And so, um, and another interesting thing uh, about this is that, is that the bites kind of progress and kind of walk from, from uh, top to bottom on this plot. Um, so where the teeth on the, on the top appear to be kind of further away from the snout, uh, compared to the shapes on the bottom, where there's possibly some compression between the jaws and this uh, snout that are shortening that distance. Um, and so, so just from this plot alone, you can see that we can get quite a lot of information about what's going on uh, in these uh, different bites, just from you know, qual qualitatively looking at, at um, the, the shape data. Um, but we can also get quantitative information, again, like how kinesis changes across uh, across bite cycles. So we're gonna go back to the, uh, to the code and run one last thing. So this, this section here is, a tab, uh, is, is uh, something that runs a kines uh, a kinesis. It basically calculates kinesis for, for each trajectory. Um, so I'm just gonna run that quickly, but the, um, the main part of this code that, you, that you'll wanna look at is this right here, this proc. And this is um, calculating the Procrustes distance uh, or the shape distance between consecutive motion shapes. Um, and, uh, and so in the R console here, you can see that we have a table where the first column is the, the kinesis between um, shape one and shape two. The second column is kinesis between shape two and shape three and then so on till the end of the motion. And then the last column is just the sum of, of each row, which is the, how much kinesis has been um, created by that motion. All right, and now once we have that, we can plot it and you should end up with something that looks like this. But I'm gonna show it here again to give a little bit more context to the kinesis values on the right and um, how they stack up to the, um, the previous plot of the shape trajectories. And so we see uh, that there's moderate kinesis for, for bite one um, where the gate closure is halted midway. Uh, then some really low kinesis in those smaller kind of nibbling bites that happen in between and then a return to high kinesis in some of the latter bites. Um, so uh, to wrap kind of things up for this section, uh, even with this really simplistic landmarking scheme uh, with you know, four landmarks uh, and just a handful of motions, uh, I hope you can get a sense for what's possible with this type of uh, approach that I, I showed today. 
And uh, with, uh, you know, with more and more data and more complex movements, there's a lot more information that we can, um, that we can learn about motion diversity. Uh, and so I welcome people to contact me if you have, uh, if you have any questions or if you wanna talk about possibilities of applying this type of method to your own kinematic or biomechanical data. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. And then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. But um, if there aren't any, we will go ahead with, um, with Mike. So I'm going to talk about, uh, let's see, yep, there go. I'm going to talk about the helical axis of motion, and I went through it a bit in the workshop last week, um, but just as a quick review, let me just share my screen. Okay, so, um, so the helical axis, uh, let me just, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so the, the helical axis of motion is, a, I think, a really useful tool for kind of merging kinematics with um, understanding how shape changes affect um, function and things like that, like uh, how mor morphology affects function. And the reason why is because the helical axis, um, so anytime you have a rigid body moving, uh, changing both orientation, so rotations, and uh, position. So we call that pose, position, and orientation. In space, um, the way, uh, the classic way to kind of represent it is with a four by four transformation matrix. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But another way you can represent it is by taking, um, you can compute an axis of space in space. So if you have a a book here and it's changing in both position and it's changing in orientation. You can compute an axis of space in space that fully describes the book rotating about that axis uh, by an amount phi. So that's an ang the uh, angle or basically range of motion that it's going through from one position to the next. And then it also translates along the axis. And the other piece of this is that the axis is also needs to be located somewhere in space. So this Q vector, um, or Q, well, it is a vector, but Q point is just any point along the axis. And it doesn't have to be anywhere specific on the axis as long as it's on the axis. And then you can kind of place it in space. So just intuitively, um, if you think about a, a car and how, oops, oh no. Okay. If you think about a car uh, with the wheels spinning, um, and you, if you put markers on the wheel and had it spin and treated the wheel as a rigid body, the helical axis would go through right, right through the axis of the car or the axle. So it's basically, it's the instantaneous axis of rotation. I don't know where my computer keeps messing up. Um, let me just jump out of, there we go. So um, what's, one of the useful things about it is it describes, uh, if you also fit a circle to the wheel, and looked at the midpoint of the circle, since the wheel is kind of spinning about itself, it would give you the same place. So that's one of the ways you can kind of link it to shape is by fitting some kind of geometric primitive. We're looking at the curvature of the joint surface um, and the helical axis can, uh, you can look at where the helical axis is relative to that um, joint surface. So as an example, if you have the car kind of up on a jack spinning, the rotation axis is gonna go right through the center. Um, if you put the car then down and have it rolling on the road and you computed the same helical axis, you would then, it would then be where the wheel meets the road, but it would be in the same orientation. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can kind of do with. So the final kind of intuitive example to give for the helical axis is a foosball player. So a foosball, when you're playing foosball, the little players basically are getting uh, have the helical axis going through them. So you rotate the player around and you can translate it. Um, you're, you're limited in how many, uh, what you can do with it, but that's essentially what the helical axis is. Okay, so <clears throat> am I still sharing my screen? Let's make sure. Okay. So just really quickly, I wanted to show. Um, an, an example with an actual bones moving. So this is some wrist data that was collected at Brown University um, by my advisor. 
And um, what it is, is it's the wrist moving through kind of a dart thrower's motion. And this is the radius bone here. So that's this bone right here in your wrist. And then this is the capitate, the bone I have in blue. And so if I want to see what the instantaneous rotation axis is or the finite axis, this, is, this data is actually from computed tomography scans taken in a couple different positions. So if I want to look at the helical axis of the capitate relative to the radius, um, I'm just going to check this little button here. So you can see it's kind of going through the ball. If you think of the capitate, the proximal end of the capitate, so right here, as a ball for a ball and socket, the rotation axis is always going through there somewhere. So if you move the wrist all around and calculated a bunch of helical axes, they would crisscross and you could compute kind of a functional joint center. So this is where kind of the center of the ball and socket articulation is. But then you can break it down further and you can say, well, if I'm flexing and extending, the axis is going kind of into the, it, along the page here. Or if I'm radial on or deviating and going like that, then the axis is perpendicular to the motion. And it actually, the axis actually raises up. And that's all related to the curvature and things like that of the, of the joint surfaces. Okay, so, <clears throat> So now I'm going to just kind of show you, uh, oh, so the last thing I wanted to show you with this wrist is one of the things that's important when you're computing this axis is you need one bone moving relative to another bone that's mathematically fixed, and it needs to be moving from one position to another position. There's other ways you can do the helical axis, but that's kind of the way I'm presenting it today. So this axis is actually the wrist moving from position one to position two, and so that, that axis that you're seeing there is moving between those two positions. Um, so I could, if I fixed another bone, so let's say I fixed the lunate here. So I'm going to mathematically fix the lunate now. And even though the transformation matrices are, are the, the postures are the same or the positions and orientations are identical between these two animations I'm showing you. Uh, right now, now I have a fixed lunate. So this bone is fixed. The capitate moving relative to the root lunate will have a completely different helical axis or rotation axis. So just to quickly show that one more time, if I fix the hamate bone, which is right next to the capitate, and uh, look at the triquetrum relative to that. So this is now this bone here, the triquetrum moving relative to the hamate. And you can see, if you think of this articular surface of the hamate as an ellipsoid, the helical axis kind of pierces that ellipsoid. Okay, so, so I'm gonna show you how to do all that. Um, I'm gonna jump over now to my um, iPad and just quickly show you what the, matri what the matrix multiplications look like to do that. So. So what I've drawn here is, this is kind of assuming you have some kind of X-ray or XROM data or any kind of motion capture data you need really. So in, in the XROM world, what you do usually is you take a CT scan or a CAT scan, computed, computed tomography scan of the bones you're interested in. So here I've represented that as a rectangle and a ellipsoid or an ellipse. And so that's bone, this is bone A and then this is bone B here. So this is a CT-based coordinate system. And then I also have an anatomical coordinate system that's tied to bone B. And we're gonna call that BACS. So then over here, I have two frames of X-ray data. They don't have to be se sequential. They can actually, it's actually better to have a little bit of motion because the helical axis gets a little bit sensitive to noise when you have very small motions. So if you have a big motion, you can, you're kind of safe doing this. So I have frame one and I have B and A are in two different positions and orientations, and then same thing for frame two. So they're moving like that. So what the autoscoping process would give you where you do your bone matching, gives you a transformation matrix, and it's a four by four matrix that takes you, takes each bone 
to their respective positions in each frame. So this is going to be, I'm going to call this matrix A, and I'm going to call it C for CT space one. So C, it moves a bone or the point cloud. So this bone is just the point cloud or a mesh like what um, everybody showed in the previous uh, presentations. It takes all, each point on the point cloud, multiplies it by this, this is a four by four matrix and puts it in this position here. So the same thing happens for matrix B, or first, sorry, for bone B. So we're gonna call that uh, BC1, so BC1. And then we're also gonna do the other frame. So this is gonna be called BC2, and this is gonna be called, it's gonna get a little bit messy, but we'll call this AC2. Okay, so these are all just matrices that, that move the bones from one frame to the other. So what we wanna do is we wanna do that uh, process where we fix, we wanna fix bone B and watch A going from position in uh, its position and orientation in frame one to its position and orientation in frame B or for frame two. So the, what that looks like mathematically, oh, I should also tell you, if I wanted to go back the other way, let's say I started in frame one and I wanted to go back to the CT space, I would just apply the inverse transform. I'm gonna make that thinner. So if I wanna go this way, back to here, that's just gonna be um, AC1 to the minus one. So that's gonna get important in a minute. So what I really wanna do is I wanna basically take these, all these bones, I wanna take bone A, move it out to frame one, take bone B, move it out to frame one, do the same thing for frame two. And then I'm gonna move the whole thing back using the inverse of the transform for B. So because I wanna mathematically fix B, I wanna move this entire uh, B and A back with the B inverse transform. So what that looks like con conceptually is, oops. And I'll post this little write-up, but basically what it's gonna do, is match this up here. So this is called mathematically fixing that bone. Let's not worry about the letters overlapping. And then if I do the same thing for frame A, or sorry, frame one, then I have the bones moving. This is now frame one. And this is frame two, and I want to move from one to two. So what that process is called, what I just did is called registering to bone B. Okay. So just to make it cleaner, the way the matrix stuff would work, we always go from right to left with a matrix. So I would take, um, I want to register basically bone A to bone B. So for frame one, I would call, I would want, I would basically start with um, the transform A, C to one. And then I would pull it back with B, C to one. The inverse of that. So this will be, let me just move this over a little bit. This will just be uh, A, C to one, and then I'm just gonna put a register there. Same thing for frame two. So it's gonna be exactly the same. So A, C to two reg is gonna be equal to B, C to two to the minus one, A, C, two. Okay, so that's saying take the position and orientation of the bone A in, in frame one that moved from A, C to one, move it back with B's transform to do that process I just showed you. So that's registered in radius. Okay, so now I have those. Now I want um, a matrix that gets me from frame one to frame two. So the way I do that 
is I'm going to draw a little diagram. So if I make this a little bit smaller. So we're going to say this is all registered already. So I start with CT space, and then I have frame one here. Then I have CT space in frame two here. And this transform is AC1 registered. And then this transform here is AC2 registered. But what I really want to do is I want to go to one from one to two for my helical axis. So we, we have to figure out what that is. We don't have that matrix. So the way we get it is we go around the circle backwards. We start at frame one, we go back to the CT space, and then we go from CT space to frame two. So what that looks like is we start with A, C1 uh, registered, and we want to go backwards, so we invert it, and then we multiply that by A, C2 registered. And this will give us, let me just move this over. This will give us A one to two registered. So that's kind of the just I know this is fast and going to yeah, do kind of a course on this, so I know this is going a bit fast, but um, again i'll post this and then i'll walk i'll now walk you through the map code. So next. Okay. Share the map code. Okay, so the MATLAB code. Um, it's all on the um, on the website, and then there's a little list if you want to follow along. Um, <clears throat> the 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 only thing you have to change is so there's a folder that everything should be in. Let me show you that. So I called mine IOMM Part Four Helical Axis. I have all my scripts in here. So these are all the MATLAB files, the .m files, and then the data is all in here. And so if you look at the data, that's in, um, this is a subject, we have a models folder, and then IV. So these, this is another point cloud format. So we've talked about ply, OBJ, and STL. There's also an IV format, which is basically just a point cloud and then connections. And the connections are just the indices of the points in the point cloud that tell you how to connect up the triangles. So if I double click on this, um, all that is, is this is just a point cloud with triangles. So if I, do line wrap, if I, it looks, if I zoom in on that, on this bone, all it is is each one of these, this is a vertex of the triangle, and then, then the, um, the connections in this file just tell you how to connect it up. Okay. So that's the models. And then we also have the kinematic trial. So this came from XROM data. So this came from a software called Autoscoper that was developed at Brown. And these .tra files, if I open these, are just a list of transformation matrices. And they're written in kind of a 1 by 16 format. So I told you the matrix that all those matrices I was multiplying before are four by four matrices. Um, and then this, just to make it easy to store, is just a big one by 16. And then the MATLAB code kind of turns it back into a four by four so you can do the matrix math. So MATLAB is actually, a, um, stands for matrix um, laboratory. And so it's basically designed to manipulate matrices. So just to kind of walk you through, and I've made it these, if you do a double parentheses and, or sorry, a double percent sign in MATLAB, that creates little cells. So you can kind of click between them. And to run a cell, if you just hit, hold the control key down and hit enter, it'll run that code. So what this section is doing is just clearing all the variables from MATLAB, 
uh, setting the model directory and the kinematics directory. So that's something you'd have to change on your own computer to match whatever you, wherever you've downloaded it. If you're on a Mac, that's going to be um, forward slashes instead of back slashes. And you can copy the directory usually out of the, um, if you click, I, I believe it's get info on your file, it'll show you where it is and you can kind of cut and paste the directories there. So hopefully that works. If you have all your scripts in the folder, uh, like I have, it, it will um, it will show you, it'll, it, it'll run just fine. When you hit run, it may ask you to um, add a path, add the current folder you're into the path or just change the directory. Either one of those will work. Okay, so just to walk you through this, this is setting the directories and then loading this read VRML fast function quickly loads all of those files. It gives you the point cloud, which is this points.cal I have here, and then the connections. So that's the triangles. Uh, MATLAB, one thing that, that's important about MATLAB is a lot of software is zeros based. So the first index is zero. In MATLAB, the first index is one. So that's something to keep in mind. So this is just correcting that. And then I'm doing some plotting here. So if I run this, up pops the bones. So this is the tail, the calcaneus, the talus, and the tibia in CT space. So I have the little CT coordinate system there to show you. Um, so this is where the bones live. So the next thing we do in the code is we pull in the kinematics. So that's what this DLM read means. It means it's uh, reading in the those dot TRL, TRA files, and then it's converting them into four by four rotation matrices with the shape function, or sorry, reshape function. Um, don't worry about this rotomat 180 degrees. That was just that's just to help with the visualization. Um, you don't strictly need that. It's just the foot was coming in upside down, and MATLAB wasn't letting me turn it right side up again. It's a uh, 3D window is a little bit limited. So then I just had have picked like a start and end frame. So this would be that frame one and frame two from the helical axis from the write up I did. So I just picked frame 30 and frame 72 because that's the, um, this is a hopping trial. So the person's hopping up and down. So this is um, going from planar flexion to dorsiflexion. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then this next bit is taking those matrices that I computed from, that I pulled in and applying the point clouds to them, just like how I did in the write-up. So it's basically taking the point cloud, applying the four by four transformation matrix and moving the tibia, the calcaneus and the talus over to um, frame 30. And then, all, and then P2 is over to frame 72. So if I run this, It'll show me the two bones in the two different positions. So we're going from magenta is frame 30, cyan is frame uh, 72. So this is all the bones. This is a, a global position in the x-ray space of the bones during a hop. So it looks like the person's kind of going to the outside uh, um, of their foot. So they're kind of jumping this way, it looks like. So like I said, we need to align these tibias. If what we want to do is what, our goal here is, is to calculate the talus, which is this middle bone here, helical axis relative to the tibia. So what we need to do is move this, the tibias together and then see what the relative motion of the talus is to, and then do from that one to two like I showed you. Okay, so that's the next bit of code. So what this does is it mathematically fixes the tibia. You can see I took the tibia transform for the start frame, and I inverted it and multiplied by, by that by the calcaneus, the talus, and the tibia. If I multiply it by the tibia, I'll just get the identity matrix back, which basically does nothing to the point cloud. I could have just deleted this line and not worried about it, but I just put it there so you could see. Same thing for frame two. So now I've mathematically fixed the tibia for both those frames and then um, transform the points using these transformation matrices I just calculated. And then I visualized it. So now what we'll see is 
we've mathematically fixed the tibia. You can't see it, but there's a magenta and a uh, cyan tibia here. And so now we're moving from, um, I think it's from magenta to cyan as the foot dorsiflexes. And so you can see the calcaneus moving up and you can see the talus also um, moving down. So it's kind of going like that. Okay, so now we have this, we just need to take this, get this transform for the turquoise tibia, or sorry, the cyan tibia, and the magenta, sorry, talus, the cyan talus and the magenta talus, and compute the rotation axis between those two positions. So that's what this next bit does. So this is just from the right up. So I've gone from the inverse of P1. This is that, so I start at frame one, I move back to CT space, and then I move out to frame two. And then that's what this matrix is. And this is the matrix I'm going to use to compute the helical axis from on. And I'm just going to give you the helical axis function. This was written at, at Brown by my advisor, uh, Trey Crisco. And uh, so this is giving those parameters I talked about, the amount of rotation about the helical axis, the vector in space, the unit vector, the translation along the helical axis and a point located on the helical axis. I've also just kind of moved the cue because when I did this earlier, it puts the cue, it puts the vector like really far away from the bone. So I just kind of manually moved it back so it's closer to the bone to make it easier to look at. Okay, and then I this quiver three plot just plots the vector. So it's plotting the vector at this new Q location, and then it's just taking the coordinates, the three D coordinates of the helical axis vector. So if I pull my plot back up, now I have the helical axis. So this just to kind of spend a few seconds on this. Um, so this is a helical axis. The way why it's super intuitive, besides the fact that it's a, the instantaneous axis of rotation, is that it's um, <clears throat> you can use the right hand rule to kind of visualize what's going on. So if you take your thumb, put it in the direction of the axis, and then visualize that you're rip, wrapping your hand around the axis, and you curl your hand toward yourself, that's the positive rotation. So if we're going from magenta from magenta to cyan, the you can think of the talus moving down, right? And, and the motion is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So if we zoom in on this, the helical, so you can see it's kind of at an angle. And you can see that this is this magenta moving to cyan is kind of going diagonal here. So that's going perpendicular, that motion is pretty much perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Actually, it is perpendicular. And then it, there could be a little bit of translation along it. But one thing to know about the helical axis that we just calculated is it really cares a lot about the rotation. So if you had two objects that were purely translating relative to each other and you computed the helical axis, it would be sitting out at infinity. But as soon as you get a little bit of rotation, it's going to go to the center of the rotation. So that's the helical axis, but let me just, so what you can, what can you do with this? So this is moving about 30 degrees, probably 25, 30 degrees, this amount of um, dorsi plantar flexion at the talus. So what you can do is you have, a, you have a helical axis vector. If you multiply the amount of rotation about the helical axis by the axis itself, it gives you how much it's rotating in each plane. So it's an alternative to Euler angles. Um, but the thing is, right now, all of this stuff is done in CT space, and what we want is we want to put it into an anatomical coordinate system. So that's the last bit of code that I was going to show you. So I computed a quick anatomical coordinate system. Don't worry about that too much because it's um, it's not we have more robust ways of computing it. I'm just using kind of an inertial axis. I'm doing a PCA on the point cloud of the tibia to get something that looks kind of like the flexion extension, ab adduction and internal external rotation axes. But this is again, not really usually the way we would do it. 
Um, <clears throat> so I've computed that. So, and then in order to put the helical axis into the tibial coordinate system, we need something called a tibia, uh, sorry, a similarity transform. So you basically take the matrix that we originally used to compute the helical axis and you sandwich it between the coordinate systems. And so it's the tibia ACS times the original matrix that we used to compute the axis. So that's again, the tail is going from frame one to two relative to the tibia. And then we multiply it by the inverse of the tibia transform. And that will make the coordinates of the helical axis be relative to that coordinate system. So let me just show you that really quick. So now you see here's a coordinate system here. And it's coded red, green, blue for X, Y, Z. So X is this axis here. Uh, green is this is the Y axis going up. And then the Z axis is going out to the side. So if you look at the Z axis, it's pointing actually in the opposite direction of the um, helical axis. So that means that relative to that axis, the amount of rotation, so the, the talus is mostly working in the sagittal plane, which is where this blue axis is here. So if we look at this helical axis, if we multiply the amount of rotation by the um, coordinates of the axis, this is the one that was just done in CT space. So if the CT coordinate system, um, it's not really meaningful because if the whole foot turned, it would be, and it started dorsiplanar flexing, the rotations could show up in different axes. But now that I'm in the anatomical coordinate system here, uh, you can see I've got most of the rotation happening, minus 26.6 degrees about, uh, happening in the about that Z anatomical coordinate system. So about this axis here. And it's negative because we did the right-hand rule and we uh, showed that we went from magenta to cyan, or sorry, we went from, um, yeah, sorry, ma magenta to cyan was positive, but the axis is facing the other direction. So then that's why it's negative. Um, and then you can see it's kind of skewed here. So that means a component of the vector is also in the y direction. And so that's internal external rotation. So that's the 6.2 degrees. Okay, so I covered a lot. I think we're pretty much out of time, um, but I will stop sharing and take any questions. So, and I, um, but if, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. This code should run as long as you get your uh, directory set up for where the data are. If there's a uh, if there's no questions, we can uh, we can wrap things up. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just want to thank I want to thank all of the speakers um, for putting together these presentations this weekend and last week. I'm actually really excited to uh, see the video and run through each of the different tutorials. I, they're all of them kind of bring new things that I haven't done before, so I'm I'm really excited to do that myself. Um, and uh, Monica, was there any any additional uh, stuff that you needed to to close out with or? Not right now. I just also want to reiterate my thanks to everybody. I think these are really useful resource. You know, I look forward to being able to share these with new graduate students as they want to, you know, start a new project. So thank you so much for putting the effort into making these accessible tutorials with the materials and everything. So um, I really appreciate it, the, the work you've put into it. And we do have more uh, workshops coming up. One is tomorrow. So please keep an eye on Twitter or the, the website, the Sims website. You can find the list. We have another uh, workshop coming up next week as well. So thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right. Well, I guess we, um, we'll leave it at that. And uh, again, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. And
uh, hopefully we'll get to uh, hear your questions in the, in the coming weeks. All right, thanks.